Hi everyone, my name is Malcolm Richards and I'm bringing the message from John chapter 3 verses 1 to 21 today. So let's pray as we come to look at God's word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus and we thank you that not only does he show us clearly how to get uh, to heaven, to be with the Lord God forever, but he also shows us that he is the way. Help us to understand your word that he speaks to us today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, right now, uh, you'd be pretty aware that we are quite obsessed with roadmaps. Now, we all get the general idea of what a roadmap is. A roadmap is a step-by-step, clear explanation of how to get from somewhere to somewhere else. At the moment, of course, it's all about COVID. How to get from lockdown to a relatively free society uh, where we don't have to worry about masks and viruses and whatever. But today I want to talk to you about a different kind of roadmap, another roadmap. Wouldn't it be great if we had a clear step-by-step instructions, a roadmap to know how to get to heaven, how to get to have eternal life. I knew a couple once, and they were lovely Christian folks, but they told me the story about what happened to them before they came to know the Lord Jesus. They weren't Christians, and they were living in a country town, and they desperately wanted to know about Jesus and know how to get to heaven. So they thought, I know what we'll do. We'll go to the local church and ask the minister. So they did that, and they went to the minister and they said, how can we become Christians? We want to know how we can have eternal life with God in heaven. Please tell us. And the minister answered, I'm actually not sure. You'll have to go and ask someone else. Now that's pretty appalling, isn't it? You'll have to agree that a minister of a church would not be able to explain to someone how to become a Christian. It's pretty hopeless. Well, in today's passage, I think that couple would have been helped, and I hope you will be as well. Because in this passage, Jesus meets a young Jewish leader called Nicodemus. Jesus has a very blunt conversation with this man. And he tells him, step by step, how to get to heaven, how to have eternal life. Jesus gives him a clear roadmap to heaven. Perhaps you've never heard this explained before, step by step, a clear roadmap. Well, if that's the case, don't worry, because we're going to listen in on this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. And by the end of it, I hope we'll all have a clear step by step view of this roadmap to heaven. So in today's talk, looking at John chapter 3, verses 1 to 21, I have four points. In the first section, we're going to meet Nicodemus and be introduced to his conversation with Jesus. And then we're going to look at the three steps in the roadmap. Step one, you must be born again. Step two, You must believe in God's one and only Son. And roadmap step three, what if you don't? What if you don't believe? So let's start at the beginning, verses 1 and 2. If you have a Bible, open it at John chapter 3. And we're starting at our first section, meet Nicodemus. Let me read these first two verses. Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish council. He came to see Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, 
For no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. At the beginning of our passage, we are introduced to this man, Nicodemus, who comes to see Jesus at night. We're actually told quite a lot about Nicodemus in these two verses. This man is a big shot in Jewish religious community. He is a Pharisee to start with. The Pharisees are a group of Jews who take their religious obedience very seriously, and particularly obedience to the laws of Moses. We also hear that he is a member of the Jewish ruling council, otherwise called the Sanhedrin. As I say, this guy is a big shot. Now, it seems that he's seen Jesus do signs and miracles. He's heard of these. And he comes to Jesus because he, he gets the impression that Jesus is genuinely sent by God. It seems, however, from our passage that Nicodemus hasn't yet been convinced that Jesus is the Messiah, as he calls Jesus rabbi or teacher rather than Messiah. But it's a fair guess that he's seen enough of Jesus and he wants to talk to him in person and he wants to find out more. Who is this Jesus sent by God? What are these miracles and signs that he can do? Now, Jesus, on the other hand, he knows exactly who Nicodemus is. Not only does he know his background, that is, he's a Pharisee and he's in the Jewish ruling council, but Jesus knows Nicodemus's heart. In verse 25 of chapter 2, we read this. Jesus did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. And Jesus knew what was in Nicodemus's heart. And he knew what Nicodemus needed to hear. He knew Nicodemus needed to hear a clear explanation of how he could get eternal life, how he could enter the kingdom of God. So Jesus directly says to Nicodemus, we're now at the first step in our roadmap, you must be born again, starting at verse 3. Nicodemus, it seems, actually didn't ask Jesus any question. He just makes a statement in verse 2. But Jesus comes straight back at him and says, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Now, if you're Nicodemus, Jesus' statement must have been both shocking and confusing. As a Pharisee, Nicodemus already knows 100% how to get into the kingdom of God and what it means to have eternal life. And it's not what Jesus just said. Nicodemus knows for sure that for those who are obedient to God's laws in the Old Testament and who live in accordance with with the Pharisees' strict reading of the law, they're already in the kingdom of God. He doesn't need to wonder how to get into the kingdom of God. He knows how to get in. And that's what makes Jesus' statement so nonsensical. What do you mean you have to be born again? It sounds like nonsense. You can't go into your mother's womb again and be born a second time. Jesus says to Nicodemus, no, let me explain. What I am saying is that to see the kingdom of God, a person needs a radical cleansing and renewing by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus' explanation of this phrase, being born again, 
He says in verse 5, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Now this phrase, being born of the water and being born of water and spirit, has caused a lot of discussion. But in the Old Testament, water is a symbol of spiritual cleansing. And the Spirit of God is responsible for the renewal and the giving of life. So what Jesus is saying here, this is not some rebirth, physical rebirth or reincarnation. No, this is a radical spiritual rebirth, a radical cleaning and renewing that only comes from the Holy Spirit. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Paul says much the same thing. He says, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. So this rebirth, it's not more of the same thing that we had when we, we came out of our mother's womb. No, it's an entirely different thing. And this radical spiritual rebirth is what anyone needs if they want to see the kingdom of God, that is, have eternal life. Well now, point two in our roadmap, you must believe in God's one and only Son. We're now looking at verses 10 to 16. Well, having heard Jesus' explanation, you can understand Nicodemus is still totally stumped. And he says to Jesus, how can this be? You see, for Nicodemus, he thought he had this totally sorted in his head. But now Jesus has upset everything and given an entirely different explanation. The obvious question now is, if it's rebirth by the power of the Holy Spirit that is needed to see the kingdom of God, to be saved, to see eternal life, they all mean the same thing. Where do we get this rebirth? How is it accessed? Well, in the following verses, Jesus gives the answer. He says, I am the key to this rebirth. And in his explanation, he points out two things. Firstly, I am the only one who knows the way. And secondly, the key to this rebirth is totally trusting in me, believing in me. So let's have a look at what Jesus says. Let's jump to verses 13 to 15. First of all, Jesus says, No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. In other words, Jesus is saying, you want to know that I know the truth about this radical rebirth that I'm saying you need to have. I am telling you that nobody else knows this information except for me. After all, I am the only one that has actually come from heaven to earth. So if we're talking about how to get from here back to there, I'm actually the only one that's done that trip. I know the way, and I'm the only one who knows the way. Secondly, Jesus says this, pointing to a fairly well-known part of the Old Testament. He says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Now, uh, if you've never read this part of the Old Testament, that's going to sound quite complicated. But it's worth us spending just a couple of minutes finding out what Jesus is talking about. You see, in the book of Numbers, in chapter 21, 
The people of Israel have just been brought out of slavery in Egypt by Moses. And there they are in the desert and they wish they'd never left Egypt. They are grumbling and they're complaining about what God's done to them. And they say, we just want to go back. Uh, this total plan of God is hopeless. And so as a punishment, God sends poisonous snakes among them. The people now were as good as dead, being bitten by poisonous snakes. And God says to Moses, make a snake made out of bronze and put it on a pole. And then anybody, anybody who's been bitten by a snake, as they look at this snake on the pole, will be cured. They will be given their life back again. Good as dead from a snake bite, but look at this snake provided by God, this means of salvation, and they will live again. And Jesus says, what I have come to do is much the same as that example in the Old Testament, but even better. You see, just like that snake, that bronze snake was lifted up on a pole, so I must be lifted up. And at this point, he's talking about his death on the cross. As I die on the cross, anybody who looks to me as I am lifted up, anyone who believes in me will not only have their life back, they will have eternal life. They will have this radical spiritual cleansing and renewing. They will live. So this is step two in the roadmap. We heard step one, that we need a radical spiritual rebirth. We need to be born again. And we've now heard step two, we obtain it by believing in Jesus. There's no magic potion, just turning to Jesus in trust. It sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? But now in verses 16 and following, John the Apostle, the, the Apostle who writes this gospel, explains. Listen to these wonderful words of John 3.16. Perhaps one of the most famous verses in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Do you see what John says here? This lifting up of Jesus happens because of God's enormous love. So big a love that he sends his son to die so that sinners can be forgiven and have eternal life. So now we get to part three of the roadmap. What if you don't? You know, every roadmap has this sort of section in it. Uh, for the COVID roadmap, it's, well, what happens if you're not vaccinated? In this roadmap of Jesus, of how to get to heaven, the question is, well, what happens if you decide not to believe in Jesus? What happens then? Well, to sum up Jesus' answer here, he says this. Basically, folks, without me, Jesus says, you are not okay. Did you notice the small word in that famous verse, John 3.16? The word perish. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. 
And if you look at verses 17 and 18 and following, you see this word condemned. You see, the alternative to eternal life with God through Jesus is not hanging out with your mates for the rest of eternity. It's actually condemnation and perishing. John sums up the human condition without Christ in verse 19. Let me read it to you. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. You see, because of our sin, because of our evil, we are perishing. Without Christ, we are condemned because of what we've done, our rebellion against God. And the alternative to eternal life is actually eternal death. Where I lived in Congo, in Africa, as a missionary, I lived in a town called Goma. You might have heard Goma. It was in the news quite a bit last year because it sits at the foot of a 10,000-foot live volcano. And last year, it erupted. When a volcano erupts, and I've seen the devastation from Mount Nyirogongo uh, next to this town of Goma, the lava comes. The lava is unstoppable. Anything in its way, that is, people, animals, buildings, trees, anything at all, it's all destroyed. Well, imagine you're standing in front of this lava flow. It's coming. There is no escape. There's nothing you can do about it. You are about to be swallowed by this molten lava. And suddenly a helicopter arrives and it lets down the ladder. And out of the loud halo they say, if you want to live, climb the ladder. Well, what are you going to choose, right? I doubt that you'll say no. Well, in a way, this is exactly what God is doing for us in Christ. We are in peril. You might not know it, but it's peril of our own making. And because of his great love for us, God wants to save us. And he's given us a way to have this radical rebirth and cleansing that we need so that we can see the kingdom, so that we can have eternal life. He didn't cause our problem. We caused our problem. But he is here to help us in our need. So let me ask you finally, we've heard the roadmap. But let me talk to you about the choices that we make. You see, just like the guy experiencing the lava flow coming at him, we've got a choice. Do we climb the ladder or not? Do we accept Jesus or not? Once I shared the gospel with a man in that very same town of Goma at the foot of that volcano. And I sat with this man for an hour or so and explained the gospel. And as far as I could tell, he perfectly understood the whole gospel and its implications. And I said to him, will you accept Jesus? Will you believe in Jesus so that you might be saved? And he looked at me sadly and said, now I understand from what you've explained to me that if I get new birth in Christ, then I have to then walk in the light of Christ and live as his 
uh, disciple and live in obedience to him. That's right, isn't it? And I said, yeah, that's right. And he said, I can't do that. He said, I'm a Congolese businessman. And in order to be a businessman, I have to be dishonest to be in business. That's how business works. If I say yes to Jesus, I can't do my business. So I'll have to say no to Jesus and stay in business. Wow. He completely understood and decided not to climb the ladder. He decided not to accept Jesus' offer of salvation. Now, there are many reasons why people say no to Jesus. Maybe they just don't believe him. Maybe they don't believe that they're in danger. But I urge you to consider what Jesus has told Nicodemus in this passage. If you don't know Jesus, if you have heard today clearly the roadmap to have eternal life, I urge you to accept God's loving offer of new life and new birth by believing in Jesus. Jesus has declared God's roadmap clearly to Nicodemus. Now you have it as well. Please accept Jesus' offer. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for the gospel. We thank and praise you that even when we were dead in our sins, Jesus died for us so that we might live and be forgiven by you. I pray for anyone who is listening to this who has not yet experienced new life in Jesus. May they be born again and have this radical renewal and cleansing by the power of the Holy Spirit by believing in Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Amen.